All right, class, we're going to continue our discussion on your analysis. So there are some precautions we need to take, just like with any other specimen. Um, remember to follow all of our standard precautions and also to use some other quality control measures. For example, testing um, or checking the expiration dates on our reagent strips, following manufacturer's guidelines for storage and testing supplies testing the urine as uh, quickly as possible so as not letting it to cool off. Take care not to contaminate um, different testing supplies or strips. Um, keeping records of quality control measures, maintaining our equipment, um, doing some control samples, things like that will really help with our safety and our quality control to make sure that we're getting the most accurate and quality results. To continue on about urine, there are different urine containers that we use. There are non-sterile sterile containers for random specimen. There are sterile containers for cultures and a 24-hour collection container. This is what we use in the hospital. This is a um, non-sterile sample cup. This tube right here is used for the normal urinalysis and this is actually a culture tube. So this culture tube would be the sterile container for the culture. And then this is a 24 hour collection jug because within 24 hours they're collecting all of the same, all of the urine. Um, so it needs to be a much larger um, container. Remember to label the specimen cup and not the lid. Um, label the patient's information on that or however your clinic um, likes you to label specimens. There are different types um, and collection methods. There is a random or spot specimen. It can be contained at, or obtained at any time, and it's the most common type. There's a first morning void specimen. This is usually in the morning um, you have the most concentrated specimen. So you have the most concentrated because your urine has been sitting there all night. So all of those um, products are gonna be a little bit more concentrated within that. And you may have a higher um, pH level as well. You may have a fasting or a timed specimen. This is based on the physician order. You may have a 24-hour specimen. So what happens in a 24-hour specimen is you will urinate, and that's the start time. You actually discard the first urine, and then everything after that for 24 hours is collected. And they're really looking for quantitative test results. So how much of the substance is in the urine with over that 24-hour period? And then the collection method. So we use a clean catch midstream collection. This is really important because a lot of patients don't know this, but what you're supposed to do for a clean catch midstream collection is you're supposed to give the patient a um, cleansing wipe. They are to cleanse the genital area before the collection. They're supposed to start urinating and then move the cup into the stream. The reason being is that you want all of the bacteria or most of it as possible to be gone. So you actually start urinating and that first little bit of urine may have a little bacteria mixed in it or different things, even after cleansing the genital area. Um, and then you want that specimen to be contained after you've started urinating. And then our catheterized collection would be a sterile specimen. And um, the only way to do that is to actually catheterize um, the urethra um, to obtain a specimen that way. And that again will be sterile. So we're looking at urine. We do a physical exam of urine. We're looking at the volume, so how much. Um, it's usually requested that you have at least 125 mLs or about half a cup to do the uh, majority of testing that needs to be done. If the quantity is not sufficient, you'll want to talk to the doctor or follow your clinical protocol. You can look at the color. Um, there's a wide range in colors that urine can come in. Um, it indicates how um, like the darker it is, it indicates that it's more concentrated. Also, diet and drugs can change the color of your urine. Some drugs can make it like an orange color. It can even be blue or green, um, all different kinds. Transparency, this is going to be if it's clear or hazy or cloudy or turbid. There may be an odor to it. So certain odors can um, give us certain information. So if it has like a sweet odor, that patient may have ketoacidosis or be a diabetic patient. If it has kind of a strong bad odor, there may be a urinary tract infection, something like that. And then specific gravity. This is the ratio of weight of a given volume of a substance 
to the weight of the same volume of distilled water at that temperature. And the normal range is 1.005 to 1.030. And it can be um, tested using the chemical test strips like we'll use in class, a urinometer or a refractometer. And there is a video um, within your PowerPoint on how to use the refractometer to measure specific gravity. Then that was the physical examination of urine. We can also do a chemical examination of urine and that's what we are going to do in class as actually looking at the chemical um, products of the urine. Some of the examples that we'll look into is the amount of glucose in the urine, its pH level, protein, ketones, bilirubin, if there's any blood, hematuria, urobilinogen, nitrites, leukocytes, and the specific gravity. So read over those and become familiar with the chemical um, products or the chemical analysis of the urine. So in class, we'll be doing a manual uh, analysis of the urine. And there is some room for error because the human is interpreting the results. And it requires manual charting onto a paper chart or into the um, electronic medical record. There are automated um, urinalysis devices, and they're easy to operate, and they are CLIA waived. In class, though, we will be, again, using the manual method, which you'll see here in this picture. Aud obviously, the automated ones are more accurate, and some devices even connect to the patient's chart so that those results are automatically uploaded, which is really nice. Okay, the microscopic examination of urine. Remember, this is going to be a more complex test, so it will fall under that moderate complexity, so it's not waived. So it means that the um, medical assistant will not be able to complete this. But um, microscopic, ex microscopic examination of the urine, considered a provider-performed microscopy procedure. Um, the MA is responsible maybe for setting up the specimen on the slide for the provider. And some abnormal urine um, things that you may see from the slide would be different artifacts, some crystals, different casts, and different elements, bacteria, yeast, parasites, items like that. That's what the doctor is looking for. Here's an example of what a urina urinalysis report form may look like and what you would use to chart your results of a urinalysis. All right, let's talk about drug screening for a minute. So remember, um, this is a CLIA waived exam, and but there is there are different protocols and legal documentations required. Um, the physician office laboratory should be certified to perform this type of testing, and the personnel um, running that should receive training on how to appropriately do the drug screening. There is a chain of custody that will take place to make sure that there's no tampering with um, the specimen. Some of that criteria for the chain of custody includes showing ID, signing a consent form, um, checking the temperature of the urine to make sure that it is actually fresh, not allowing the patient to bring in any bags or baggy jackets or things like that, inspecting the bathroom before and after the patient provides the sample. All of those different items make sure that the, the test is actually um, that patient's urine and that it hasn't been tampered with for the accuracy of the drug screening. All right, so that covers everything for um, your analysis. So we're moving on to my, uh, the medical my, uh, microbiology. And this is the study of pathogenic organisms like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Most of these tests are complicated and are not really um, done within the clinic. However, um, there are many CLIA test kits that are being developed, so that's good for us. It's something a little bit faster than sending those results out and waiting for the lab to process those. But the role of the medical assistant in microbiology within the physician office laboratory is to obtain the specimen, um, if it is a wave test, to test the specimen, prepare the slides for examination um, using the microscope for the provider, and to prepare cultures for transport to a bigger laboratory. Some of the micro, uh, microbiology equipment that may be within the laboratory would include an autoclave. Hey, y'all should remember that word, right? 
microscopes, safety hoods, incubators, anaerobic equipment, inoculating equipment, incinerators, culture media, and refrigerators. If you guys have taken microbiology, you should be familiar with a lot of these um, types of supplies and equipment. Right, around micro, uh, microbiology specimens, safety and con control measures. Obviously, we're never going to eat or drink working around these different specimens. We're going to use appropriate PPE and wear gloves. We're going to follow the proper um, protocol for disposing of these specimens if we need to. The type of equipment that we're using needs to have um, controls checked on it. Microscopes need to be cleaned and kept dust free. Um, running and checking expiration dates. Throwing away anything that are past the expiration dates or those shelf lifes. Following the laboratory manuals and updating those periodically. Um, having safety data sheets available if we need to reference those. And performing any of those quality control testing and logging those in different lab logs. Okay, so let's talk about collecting microbiology samples. So we want to um, have the best quality sample, right? So that we can have the best quality result. So we want proper collection from infection sites. We want to collect the specimen during the infectious period, so not waiting too late or doing the test too early. We need a sufficient amount of specimen. Also, this the appropriate container. Appropriate transport medium or inoculation medium. We want to make sure that it's labeled properly, delivered to the lab in an appropriate amount of time, and collected prior to antibiotics being administered. So one thing that we do in the ER is that we have to um, collect blood cultures prior to giving antibiotics. If we give the antibiotics and then get the blood specimen, it's not going to be accurate because we already have those antibiotics fighting off whatever the infection may be, and so those blood cultures can be um, incorrect. So some of the types of cultures that we may be gathering to be sent to the lab would be urine cultures, which we talked a little bit about. Throat cultures, you can think for throat swabs for different reasons. Nasopharyngeal, um, one right now, COVID, is a nasopharyngeal swab sent off. Wound cultures, sputum cultures, stool cultures, cerebrospinal fluid, and blood cultures. In class, we will go over throat swabs and wound specimens, wound swabs, um, to be sent for culture. All right, viruses. So vir virology in the medical laboratory. They are special. Viruses are really special microorganisms. They're really small. Um, they're all pathogenic, meaning they're all, they can all cause disease. They invade the cells and take over and reproduce. And they have few treatments um, available for viruses. If you've ever heard, you know, if it's a virus, it has to run its course pretty much. Um, vir viral infections can be diagnosed through antibody blood testing, tissue samples, um, culturing, viral DNA and RNA, and some rapid tests. We do have some tests for certain viruses that can be used. For instance, the flu. We have a rapid test for the flu. It tells us if you are positive or negative for the flu. Right, bacteria in the medical laboratory. 80% of all bacteria are harmless. We have good bacteria, but there's also bad bacteria, right? And that's why we send off cultures. We can also do a microscope examination. There are some rapid test kits, as I mentioned, that are uh, more and more being developed all the time. One being our strep test. So if you've ever had a sore throat and had a doctor um, think that it might have been strep, you probably were swabbed in the back of your throat, and play, it was placed into a rapid test kit to tell us if you had strep throat. And then sensitivity testing. That culture and sensitivity is used um, to determine what type of antibiotic yeah, antibiotic will help destroy the type of bacteria that you have growing. All right, parasites. Quickly talk about parasites. They can be found in blood, urine, or feces. It's important that we obtain the specimen and instruct the patient on how to do so. Um, with more travel across the world, we are seeing more parasites um, in our patients in the United States. There are um, foreign countries often have more parasites than we do in the United States. 
and for us, intestinal parasites are the most prevalent type here in the United States.